Welcome to everyone. It's awesome to see so many participants signing in from all over the country. My name's Karina. I am the Executive Director of Bridging Voice, and we're really excited to be here with our team to present our um, training on ALS and communication. We only have an hour together today, so um, the, the good news is that this is just the first in a series of trainings we're going to be offering. So this is going to be sort of the 10,000 foot view, um, but we will have a chance to dive deeper into a lot of the topics we're going to cover today. Uh, so before we dive in, I just want to go over a few housekeeping points. One, we are recording today's session. Uh, two, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please drop those into the chat and if we are, we'll either answer them as we go or we are going to try and reserve at least 20 minutes at the end of today's training uh, for a Q&A. So just as questions come up, drop them in the chat and we'll address them during the Q&A. Uh, three, just to let you guys know, the goal of this training as with all of our trainings is to make it as practic practical and useful to you as possible. So please, we love your feedback. Um, and as I mentioned, this is just the first of a training series. So your feedback is really valuable as we start shaping that series. Um, also, I just want to acknowledge we have some incredible expertise on this call. We have so many, it's you know primarily practitioners on this call. Um, and I know that you guys have incredible experience working with um, patients with ALS and with AAC. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you for being here and make sure that everyone is sharing uh, your questions and your insights because we really believe that we can learn together on this on this and future trainings um okay so jumping into the agenda uh first we're going to give you an overview of bridging voice some of you are familiar with us um and some of you might be introduced to us for the first time so we're going to introduce our team i'm very excited we have our entire care team on the call today we're going to let you know what we do as an organization and how we how we work um we're going to let you know a little bit about a new initiative that we just launched in new jersey and then we'll jump into the main content today, which is an AAC overview for ALS. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to reserve about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, so introductions. As I said, my name is Karina. I am fortunate enough to be the executive director of Bridging Voice. I really work behind the scenes <laughs> and oversee our, our partnerships, our training series, our referral partnerships. Um, and I get to work with these uh, lovely people every day. Nahum? Uh, hi, I'm Nathan Lehman. I'm the technical director of Bridging Voice. Um, I'm a programmer by trade, but have been working with uh, PALS and eye tracking for over 15 years. Hi, I'm Deborah Zeitlin. I'm a speech language pathologist and an augmentative communication specialist and the clinical director of Bridging Voice. Before working for Bridging Voice, I was the director of the Center for Rehab Technology at Helen Hayes Hospital and um, augmentative communication has been my passion for the past 40 years. Cool. Come into focus. I'm Eddie Ehrlich. I'm an occupational therapist and a mechanical engineer. Uh, in addition to augmentative communication, my specialty area is alternative access to phones, tablets, and computers. And I'm Trinity. Um, I am the only uh, Bridging Voice team member actually that is not uh, on the East Coast. I am our West Coast representative. Um, I'm a speech pathologist and an augmentative communication specialist. And prior to joining the Bridging Voice team, I was working um, in home health. Great. So to introduce you to Bridging Voice, if you don't already know us, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We're a little over two years old, but we've been growing very quickly. Um, and we support ALS patients by providing a holistic support for all of their technology needs related to communication and computer access. So we are very focused on supporting communication for PALS. The challenge that um, we saw, and as you heard, our team members have been working in this space for decades, um, is the issue of either PALS were not getting the technology they needed to communicate, or even when they did get the right technology, there was the issue of technology abandonment, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with the term. As great as the technology is, if it's collecting dust in the corner, it's not useful. So our goal as an organization is to ensure that every ALS patient has access to the support that they need to communicate period. And all of our services are provided remotely and are free of charge, regardless of insurance status. Um, so we're very proud of that. We want to be accessible to all. 
uh, we, as I mentioned, we have a very holistic approach and we work with uh, PALs and SLPs, and we work with PALs and caregivers at every stage of their diagnosis from um, early to late. So uh, a few examples of the type of uh, services we provide are education, helping uh, PALs to obtain the right technology and educating them on their options. Training, we provide ongoing training in, in the technology and help clients get the most out of their technology. We customize solutions. This is something really unique to us to make sure that the technology works for every individual client. We realize that especially with ALS, every situation is different, every person is unique. So we make sure that the, the technology is customized for them. And then we provide ongoing technical support. We all know we live in a world with a, a lot of technology and all the things that can go wrong with it. Um, so we're there to make sure that the devices are always providing safe communication for PALS. And then lastly, innovations. Um, all of our team, team members on this call are in, incredibly talented, tech savvy, and are constantly creating new solutions for clients. And when we create those new solutions, we like to share them with the broader community to make sure they have the biggest impact possible. Uh, so Nick, just to give you a little sense of our um, organization, uh, we were launched on the East Coast. Most of us are based in New York. We started in the tri-state area, uh, but very quickly we started serving PALS across the United States. Because as I mentioned, all of our services are provided remotely through emails, phone calls, Zoom uh, video chats and uh, remoting into people's devices. So over the past two years, we have supported over 865 PALS across 46 states. Um, and we, we've actually also supported PALS in 10 different countries. We're focused on the United States, but that just sort of happened organically as well. Um, and the other thing that I think is just important to mention um, is that on average, uh, a PAL that is working with us gets about 10 services from us. So 10 support interventions. So that could be uh, a customization, that could be a technical support call. Um, but the idea is that it's not just one interaction. We are providing ongoing support um, as their situation changes and as their needs change. Just one, one note on this, we're still missing Hawaii. So if anyone on the call is from Hawaii and has pals that we need to serve in Hawaii, let us know. Our team is very excited to support them. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about how we support, uh, how we support SLPs, because I think most of the people on the call, call today are practitioners. Um, so the way we work is through a referral partner process. Um, and what that means is we partner, um, with organizations. It could be ALS clinics, it could be individual SLPs, um, or it could be nonprofits that work with ALS, uh, PALs that work with ALS clients. Um, and through them, they refer PALs to us who they think would benefit from our services. Um, so we have a referral link that they have. It's a, a unique uh, referral code. They send us information on the person with ALS, and then we reach out to them directly and start providing support. Um, I know sort of the question uh, for many of you on the call, many of you on the call might already be referral partners. For those of you who aren't, um, right now we are not bringing on new referral partners, but we hope to, and I'll explain why here on our next slide, um, but we are hoping to bring on new referral partners in the near future. So if you are interested in become in learning more about being a referral partner or how you could work with us, I'm gonna drop our um, uh, a link into the chat. And this, if you sign up, it'll get you on our wait list to be a referral partner. And we will reach out to you as soon as we're able to bring on new refer referral partners. So let me, there we go. So in the chat, there's the wait list for referral partners. Um, if you are interested, please sign up and we will reach out to you and provide more information as soon as we are able. Um, but what we are doing is we are providing this training series. So um, as I mentioned, we've been, our team has worked with over 865 PALs over the last couple of years and has gained incredible insight into um, what is needed to provide communication to PALs. Um, so this training series is a way of us to share those insights, share the tips and tricks and best practices that we've gathered um, to, and to be able to help support you. So this training series will hopefully uh, provide one way to provide you support. If you're interested in being updated on future trainings, I'm dropping a, uh, another link into the chat. If you just sign up with your name and email, it'll, we'll make sure that you're updated on our future trainings as well. Um, uh, 
uh, the third thing I just wanted to mention is a way that we're supporting SLPs and sort of the AAC ecosystem um, is we have started a pilot program where we are supporting uh, SLPs to start ALS AAC evaluation clinics. Um, it's one of the things we found is that there's not nearly enough places for PALS to get support for AAC. Um, so through this program, our team works directly with SLPs and provides them remote support and training to be able to open their own ALS AAC clinic within their organization. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, feel free to reach out to us. I will um, drop, I didn't have this link ready, uh, just our email into the chat. So if you have any follow-up questions um, about any of this, please reach out to us and we'll make sure to get back to you. Um, and then lastly, individual support. A big part of what we do, the services we provide are not to replace the incredible work that is already happening out there, but to fill gaps. So we love working with SLPs and other practitioners who are interested in AAC to be able to help support them to provide better care um, to their pals. So that's a big part of what we do and what we believe in. So if you, know, you, you um, need support, if you have questions, you wanna to talk to our team, please reach out. Um, I will just briefly talk about a very new um, initiative that we've just launched. I think there's a few people from New Jersey on this call. Um, as I mentioned, we've been working with PALS through our referral system across the United States. But this past July, we just launched our first statewide initiative. Uh, so this is being supported by uh, the governor and his wife, uh, Tammy Murphy, and an incredible group of philanthropists as part of the Renew Jersey Fund. Um, and thanks to them, Bridging Voice is able to provide support to every single PALS across the state of New Jersey. So um, if you or if, if um, you work with PALS in New Jersey or if you know PALS in New Jersey um, who want to uh, want to have support, we work with PALS at every stage. Just encourage them to reach out to us. The best way to do that is to go to um, the New Jersey website, which is newjersey.bridgingvoice.org. And they can sign, sign up with a two minute survey um, and then we will reach out to them directly. Um, again, who should sign up? Any PALS at any stage of diagnosis living in New Jersey, we think could benefit from this program and our services and our support. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're hoping to see this replicated um, in other states across the country in the near future. So um, if anyone has ideas about how they can bring this to their state, always feel free to reach out to us. I also just quickly wanted to touch on our philosophy as an organization. I think that um, we are pretty unique. Uh, we're as a nonprofit. Um, we are given the ability to do a lot of things that uh, sometimes practitioners working in a clinical setting have uh, less flexibility on. Um, and so I think our philosophy is a, sort of reflects who we are as an organization. So one, we believe that PALS should always be able to communicate. Two, we believe that simple interventions can make a huge difference and we want to share those interventions through this training series. Three, we believe that outreach and follow-up is key. Too often, uh, PALS have uh, situations changing in their lives, in their homes, and they don't reach out for help. So we are very active as an organization, constantly following up with the PALS that we work with. Four, technology is a tool. We are very, um, we're talking about assistive technology. Everyone on here um, loves technology, but we believe it is a tool and not a solution. It is only as useful as um, the ability for people to, to put it into practice. And lastly, we believe in a personalized approach, customizing solutions to the individual. Uh, with that, um, that is our overview of Bridging Voice. Uh, and we are now gonna get into the meat of the training and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Trinity. All right, thank you, Karina. So as, we, um, as our group has come together collectively, we have many years of experience and we're sharing with you some of the challenges that we have received or we've uh, seen regarding um, AACA for PALS, including a lack of knowledge about what device and strategy options are available, challenges get, even getting a device, including finding a vendor to get trial equipment, speech pathology availability to complete the evaluation, oftentimes productivity limitations are limiting speech pathologist availability, funding limitations, including uh, PALS who are on hospice or in a facility, and also the lack of knowledge about state run and local loan programs. Also getting the wrong device or at the wrong time, 
technology abandonment. As we know, one to two visits after receiving a device is not sufficient to make someone consistently successful. Ongoing training and consistent follow-up with the AAC user and caregiver training is required. We often have follow-up limitations due to insurance, staffing, and productivity constraints. Also, the need for customizations and ongoing support is often limited by our own knowledge, insurance funding, and changes in the level of care <laughs> Nepal needs, such as moving from their home into a nursing facility. So uh, we are a group of therapists and professionals. And I think without even noticing, we use a lot of abbreviations and jargon. In fact, Trinity just had a slide, AAC, use the word AAC. And it, it's worth taking a moment to reminding ourselves just what AAC means, how, uh, how big an umbrella it is and what it includes. And for those who are uh, less familiar with the definition <laughs> as well. The reason we say AAC because it's quite a mouthful to say alternative and augmentative communication, right? But uh, what is AAC? So it includes more than any individual thing. Devices, systems, and the strategies and tools that replace or support natural speech. And communication is not just uh, talking and speaking or text-to-speech even, but it includes face-to-face, -face, reaching someone in another room, email, texting, and phone calls. And I think there are probably more that are not on this list, but communication is getting broader and broader all the time. Okay, so um, communication support for people with ALS involves a range of interventions and strategies. And we have broken this down into seven categories, seven different categories of communication intervention. And here, here they are. This list is not exhaustive. And today's training is the first, and as, as Karina said, it's the first in a series of trainings. And we are, today we wanted to introduce you to Bridging Voice, who we are, how we provide our services. We wanna give you an overview of the landscape of communication intervention for people with ALS and acquaint everyone with common terminology and, and really what exists. We, as Karina also said, we will have future trainings on all of these topics and we're going to go um, in each, on each topic in depth um, on the different challenges, solutions, tips and tricks for making people with ALS successful communicators. So with this training, we hope both people with ALS and caregivers become familiar with the big picture of communication intervention. And mostly we want to help speech pathologists to ensure that their patients with ALS can be successful and maintain communication through, the di through their diagnosis. So it's really important though, to note that everyone with ALS will experience communication changes differently. Some people with ALS may not need any of these communication solutions. Some may, may need many of these. Everyone will need whatever they are, the different solutions at different times of their ALS journey. So really what I'm trying to say is not everyone follows the same path. And one way that Bridging Voice can be helpful is with the decision-making decision process of which communication intervention is needed and when it is needed. So let's um, start to look at some of these interventions. So the first, um, the first of these seven communication interventions is voice conservation strategies. So for people with ALS and, and those that have a dysarthria, it's really important to try to maintain one's ability to speak for as long as possible. So having a mindful approach to communication and using voice and speech conservation strategies can be really helpful. So here's a list of strategies that I typically review with my clients. Amplification. Oftentimes using an amplifier helps to reduce vocal fatigue by reducing the effort needed to speak. On the bottom, we usually recommend um, amplifiers that are small, people can wear around their neck. They can wear you know, on their waist or attached to a belt loop. You can see examples on the bottom there. And as you know, an amplifier doesn't really change the quality of one's speech, but makes speech louder. So I'll give you an example of how I use amplification. A client that I have right now that's using an amplifier, he may not use it during the day at home with his wife, um, but when he has people over or he goes out and he's in a group and he needs to be louder, he'll use that amplifier. 
and he uses it every day when he is making a business phone call, when he knows he's going to be speaking for longer periods of time, and he knows that the amplifier will reduce the vocal fatigue. So um, also with um, respiratory insufficiency that you get with um, ALS, learning to better coordinate um, respira respiration and phonation is real important. Um, periodically resting one's voice helps to reduce overall vocal fatigue. Basically learning to conserve energy, you know, and speaking is really important, very helpful. Slowing one's rate. Exaggerated articulation, especially at the end of a word can be very um, helpful in making um, speech better understood. Postural adjustments, which I always need to do, can improve, improve breath support for speech production, hydration for vocal fatigue, something that's not listed here, environment. Avoiding adverse speaking environments, reducing background noise. It's my pet peeve, I'll get on the phone with someone and I'm trying to understand them and there's a TV blaring in the background telling people to turn off the television, sometimes increasing lighting that you can, you can see their um, articulatory movements is really helpful. So there's a bunch of things and there are more that we, we would go into at, a, at another point, but these are the ones I bring up mostly with my clients. So let's go on to the next intervention, which is um, voice and message banking or voice preservation. And I assume most of you have heard a lot about voice and message banking. Um, I do most of the intakes for people, for the um, people with ALS that come to Bridging Voice. So I think I've spoken to about well, well, well over 800 people in the last couple of years. And um, I found that many of these folks um, are really confused with voice and message banking, the definitions, what they are, how they're used. So, you know, again, we're going to have a full training on this topic, um, but I just wanted to um, go over a couple of things that I mentioned to my clients. So basically, um, something that I say that's real important to them is accomplishing voice and or message banking is a personal choice and may add character to the communication device, but not doing so will not hinder one's ability to use a speech generating device as they will be able to use a generic speech um, voice, a, a generic computer voice. And actually some of my clients prefer using maybe a, a British voice, a, a voice with a Southern accent. Um, sometimes voice banking is really, really meaningful for someone with ALS, and sometimes it's even more meaningful for the person's family or caregivers. And it's really best to start, if you're going to do, um, someone's going to do voice banking, it's best to start early on in the diagnosis. And it's important for people to know, um, people with ALS to know that if they did not get to bank their voice, or if it's too late for them to bank their voice, that it, they are able to have a close family member or a, a friend, a close friend, um, create a proxy voice for them to use. Um, so that's, you know, people get really concerned with, you know, I haven't done it, should I do it when I didn't do it in time? So it's really, I tried to alleviate um, people's um, concerns. So what are they? Voice banking is using a particular program, a headset and a computer to create a synthetic voice that resembles your voice and can accurately speak almost anything you type. So basically, it's like a text-to-speech format Every, after you create the voice and put the voice into the communication device or the app. Um, anything you type is spoken in that voice that was created. And message banking. Message banking is recording entire phrases, meaningful expressions, terms of endearment, which can be spoken exactly as they are recorded with the same emotion and intonation. And one can save these messages by using a voice recorder, an app on the phone now, a, um, a computer and a headset. And um, to use these messages, you basically, you select the pre-programmed message in the communication device, and then you hear the full recorded message. So it is important to note though, that recording and banking voice and messages is only the first step, and that the voice and messages then need to be uploaded to the communication device and the app. And oftentimes the people with ALS do need some training on how to use them. So now on to my esteemed colleague, Eddie. Thank you. So, um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. So we have some sirens. If you, um, if you hear that in the background, you'll understand. Um, so uh, if you look at the progression on the left side, voice conservation strategies, voice and message banking, you know, those, those two assumptions are that someone is still using their natural speech. Um, when it comes to alternative access on the ALS journey, we may be departing from that situation. Someone may or may not, depending on their ALS journey, 
may or may not have uh, their natural speech. So uh, alternative access um, connects with AAC uh, in, at many different points. Basically, if you have changes, if you have a client that has changes in, that limit the use of their arms and hands, as arms and hands are usually the access uh, body parts that we use, there are alternate ways to control your technology. And again, that's phone, computer, and tablets, and sometimes other things like bed controls and remote controls and such. Um, these other methods, uh, besides the standard mouse, keyboard, touchscreen, we generally call them as a group alternate access or alternative access. And they can be extremely useful and effective at different stages of the ALS journey. And because of the unpredictability of ALS, someone who is using one of these methods, like uh, a trackball down at the bottom, the red ball is a, a large ball trackball, or a Dragon Professional for Windows access. Just as an example, it's hard to predict how long someone with ALS might be using this alternate access method. Uh, the one next to it, trackpad, um, you know, uh, breaking the trackpad off of a laptop and putting it onto someone's leg or onto a table is often all someone needs. And the last one there is an example of a head mouse, that's the Kuha Zono. Uh, being used on an iPad. So one of the examples of head mice. So just running through the, the, the list there. So alternate mice and keyboards. Um, if you have trouble isolating a finger, um, and then using a stylus. Uh, if uh, you still want to be able to mouse, but hands, feet are not an option, head movements may be useful. But really, voice input is, uh, has been tremendous. If your voice is still intact and strong, there are many ways to access via voice. Before you get to often what happens to many ALS patients, and that is getting to eye tracking as an alternate access method. Onward to communication apps. All right, communication applications. You know, So many of us use apps um, in our everyday life that um, when we transition a PALS onto a communication application, it's often very well um, received and they're very useful um, as a communication solution before moving somebody into a higher level speech generating device such as eye tracking. If they're still able to access their phone or their tablet using their hands or any one of the alternative access methods that Eddie just spoke of. And there are many apps that we can recommend. I mean, if you go to any one of the app stores or you know Google Play, or you're gonna see there's a lot of them. Uh, we can recommend them based upon someone's physical abilities, if they banked their voice and want to be able to use that in their application. Um, so price point features, um, as well as what they're wanting from their app and their communication goals. Some people just want something very simple and some people want a lot out of their app and knowing which is which is important. When we recommend an app um, at Bridging Voice, we really complete an assessment, which is oftentimes commonly referred to as a feature matching to ensure that we're recommending the best app for each individual PALS. But again, like we said, not every PALS is the same. So customizing the application versus just as first downloading the app and walking away is really beneficial because the app is most likely not set up ideally for the PAL since they're so different. An example of some simple customizations that you can do is um, using a keyboard from within the app that it's much larger than like the native Apple keyboard that you would use. Or for example, squeezing the native keyboard so that someone, instead of it having being across the entire screen would then be small so that they could just swipe with one hand if they're able. All right, our next slide. All right, manual communication. So manual communication is referred to in many different ways. It is a light tech or a no tech communication method. You may have also heard it referred to as a low tech but we'd like to move away from that terminology. Manual uh, communication includes strategies like the use of eye movements, such as if you're sitting at someone's bed, you can say, look at the window for 
yes and look at the door for no, as well as gestures such as a head nod or even eyebrows. My pals are really good with their eyebrow movements. Manual communication includes strategies. Oh, sorry, apologies. Writing, uh, also writing using whiteboards, using whiteboard apps, or even LCD writing tablets like the boogie board. And if you don't know what the boogie board is, definitely look it up. And it's not the kind that you need at the beach. This also includes using manual letter scan and category boards, as well as laser pointers with amazing 80s style headbands. <laughs> All right, time for a poll, our first interactive poll. Karina, are you ready for it? Let's do it. Okay, here we go. What I would love to know from all of you is how many of you frequently recommend one of these strategies and how often do you recommend them? Oh, okay, I love this. Look at always, yes. <laughs> Okay, keep coming. And I will note that this is anonymous, so don't feel yeah. <laughs> don't feel that it's an anonymous no poll. Judgment. <laughs> but we'd love to see it. And this is listen, this is not just for clinicians. This is for every single person that interacts with a pal. So I know there's a lot of like ALS uh, org staff that includes you too. <laughs> okay, there's a couple more coming in. Okay, this is something that we feel very, very strongly about is that every PALS should have a light tech method of communication, even if they have the best high tech system in place. You cannot access your device while on the toilet, in the shower, in a transfer sling, or as many of our pals are currently facing during a natural disaster can limit their ability to access a communication device. So Karina, do you wanna take the poll away for me? So 74% of you said always, which is amazing. So the 26% is, I, I hope to give you some strategies here today and let you know how important this is for everybody. All right. All right. Uh, go to the previous slide for me. All right, so on this slide down at the bottom, we've got three pictures down there. Um, and this, these are just a couple of the many, many options for manual communication. So the first one you're gonna see is just an alphabet and phrase board. And you can see that the PALS has a stylus in their hand. So finger isolation is difficult. So you can use something large and just kind of just hook through their hand with a stylus coming out to the side that you then can use to um, point at the letters and phrases. The next you'll see, we've got an eye link and this is a clear board with letters printed on it. And the communication partner is holding the board between you as well as the partner. Um, and this allows you then to look to see where the PALS is looking and the communication partner can see what letter that the PAL is looking at in order to spell things out. And then we have an ETRAN, and this is an encoding board where PALS can look at the corner where the letter is located, and then the partner can either call out the letter that you see in the group, or you can encode further by using location and colors. All right, next slide for me. All right, so these are just some simple examples of letter, phrase, and category scanning boards. And there's, this is nothing more than a Word document that PALS can easily customize or you can easily customize. Print these at home or print them uh, wherever, slip them into a plastic page or even a laminator. And they can be used with partner assisted scanning or even with direct selection. Providing support for PALS is very time consuming, we all know. But if you take one thing away, one thing away, you can make the biggest bang for your buck by making sure that you never walk away from an interaction with a new PALS without making sure that they have a light tech communication method. You will change the quality of their life by giving them a simple way to consistently communicate. 
I wish I had time today to share with you just a fraction of the stories that pals have shared with us about tragic events that have taken that have happened to them or taken place with them when they did not have access to their high tech device or their device was broken. So please make sure every pals that you come across in whatever fashion it is, has a consistent way to respond to yes and no questions and has a light tech communication strategy in place. Uh, uh, speech generating devices, SGDs. Um, so as everyone on this call probably knows, they are electronic devices that speak for appeals and they provide access to phone, text, emails, internet, TV, and much more. Um, I think everyone will also agree that completing an assessment and trials with an SLP is absolutely required. Um, an assessment is necessary to ensure that PELs get the device that meets their needs and is most compatible with their abilities and technology goals. Choosing the right SGD is probably one of the most pivotal decisions that PELs can make. So it's so, so important that they trial several devices and make an informed uh, decision under the guidance of the evaluating speech pathologist. I always like to say that uh, SGDs are like car mechanics. One person may love a particular device and the next person will completely hate it. So it's especially true when, uh, when it comes to eye tracking devices. So really, I, I'm sure you've told this to your pals all the time, but it's just so important that they don't rush the, the trials and they don't rush, rush the decision and they get the device that's going to actually work for them now and later. Um, especially because insurance only funds a device once in five years. So it's not like they get a second chance at that decision. Um, if someone doesn't have insurance or the copay is too steep, so there are many organizations who offer loaner equipment. Um, there are many ways to control and access an SGD, um, including eye tracking. Um, we try to support all of those access methods. And step-by-step, -step, training is required to ensure communication efficiency. Um, it, it is very difficult for PALs to learn these things by themselves, as we, we all know. Um, eye tracking specifically is a very steep learning curve and it's a learning process. So most people need a lot of support in this area. And we know there are many speech generating device companies. So, and no one device works for everyone. So again, just important for people to keep an open mind and try several devices. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is my favorite topic, which is customizations. Um, you know, modifications are an ongoing process as one's ability changes. Um, and these changes are related to their needs and preferences. And preferences. Um, now, we don't have time to discuss all of the ways we can customize an SGD to make it more effective for APALs, um, but we can summarize it into something which is very encouraging. And that is that you can significantly improve someone's quality of life by making simple modifications to their SGD. Um, there are many levels. Some modifications are as simple as just changing a single setting on the device. And some modifications require real computer programming, but regardless, the, the, chain, the, the, the impact you can have is unbelievable. And Bridging Voice is here to ensure these customizations happen for the people who need them and are always available for the next person who needs that. Um, one example of an advanced customization that we provide is a translation button that we put onto almost all of the software that's available today for eye tracking and on Windows devices, which is on uh, any of their communication boards, we can put a button where they will type something in English, a message. And when they click that button with their eyes, it will speak that message in whatever language they require. And we have, uh, we have a pals who only speaks English, but his caregiver only speaks Russian. And now there is no communication breakdown because he can speak in Russian 
through his eye tracking device. Uh, we have another PALS. She speaks Russian and the caregiver speaks Portuguese and that's not an issue. So that's just one example. Um, we also have to remember that because changes happen during a PALS journey, what works today may not work tomorrow without some tweaking. It's probably even more, more, uh, more than that. So if someone you know um, has an SGD and they feel it could or should work better for them, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, there's often something we can do to help. And we actually have one quick poll on this question, uh, which is, have you ever worked uh, with a PALS that progressed past their ability to use their SGDs? So yeah, it looks like a lot of you already, 13 people have experienced this. And I think this is one of the things that our team is amazing at doing is every day we work with a new client who um, people thought could no longer communicate. And through these customizations that Nahum is talking about, they were then able to communicate. Um, this is an incredible topic. We will be taking a deeper dive on it and sharing more of those in a future training. Um, but I think the takeaway from this is that um, a lot of times when we think there's no longer a solution, uh, there is. There's a lot of customizations that can bring back the ability to communicate. Um, great. So takeaways. I know time goes by fast. Um, we covered a lot of material. Uh, I think the important thing um, that we want everyone to know is there's lots of options to communicate. Um, and what's important is to find what's right for PALS when it's right for them. So timing is key. Uh, we believe that PALS should always be able to communicate. And our future trainings are going to go into detail with case studies, tips and tricks, and then hopefully uh, much more time for Q&A where um, participants can actually bring questions uh, from clients that they're currently working with. Um, I also just want to note that we will be sharing the recording and a handout from this training. So if you weren't seriously taking notes, don't worry. Um, and we'll also share a link uh, to sign up for those future trainings. So if some of these topics are ones that you're excited to take a deeper dive on, um, do sign up and we'll be able to um, take a deeper dive with you. Uh, just to give you an example, this is the handout you'll be receiving that goes through all seven of those categories. Um, and so we're going to take one last poll before we go into the q and I'm basically just really excited that I figured out how to do the poll on Zoom. Uh, but we want also we really want your input on what our next training we're going to be going into all of this, but we're curious which ones you're most excited for. So um, of these seven topics that we lightly touched on today, which one uh, would you like to focus on for the next training that we offer? Voice conservation, voice and message banking alternative access, communication apps, manual tech, SGDs, and customizations. I'll just give you a couple more seconds for people to answer. Yeah, it definitely seems like the customizations are in the lead in communication apps. Let me take a note of this. Um, with uh, also uh, interest in voice and message banking and SGDs. Okay, great. Um, thank you for pr your participation in our polls. Uh, it makes them a lot more fun for me, at least. <laughs> um, okay, so we are now uh, to the Q&A section. Um, first, I just want to highlight the links um, in case people have to drop off. But uh, if you have questions, email us at info at bridgingvoice.org. You can check out more about our work at our main website, bridgingvoice.org. And then if you or anyone you know is based in New Jersey um, and wants to take uh, advantage of this initiative that's providing support to every pal in New Jersey, you can check out our newjersey.bridgingvoice.org website. Um, but now we're going to jump into Q&A. Um, and I'm going to start. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. There were a few questions that were submitted um, ahead of time. And one of them actually 
goes straight to this question of customizations. And it seems like you guys are really interested in that. So we had a question um, of you could give another example of what a customization might look like, Nahum. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I have screen sharing. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, let me, okay. I guess I'll, I'll show, I'll show you um, one of the customizations that is our most popular one. Um, so one of, I mean, everyone knows that by eye tracking, people are very often their accuracy is just, just doesn't work for the keyboards they're using. And, you know, you often see someone, um, you see someone trying to type and they try to hit the letter and then they backspace, try again. And sometimes that could go on a number of times. This particular board has in it two very major customizations that we've done. One of them is simple. One of them is not simple. The, the one that's simple is that we took the P of the QWERTY keyboard and put it under the L. And this gives us the ability to have a nine across QWERTY keyboard, which that real estate is so crucial to some people's accuracy. So instead of having to have 10 buttons across, this is, we call it our QWERTY nine. And um, a lot of pals have a much easier time typing when they only have nine across. But the more, that's the simple customization. The more complex one is the, if someone's trying to type the word hello, and as they're trying to target the H, instead they hit the G. So we know what's gonna happen normally, they'll press backspace and they'll potentially hit the G again. So, and that could just keep going on and on. So in, we have, when you press backspace, the G disappears. So now they have a much better chance at getting the H. If for whatever reason, they still are not accurate and they hit the J, so now the J is in the message window. If they hit backspace again, now both the G and the J are missing. So within two or three times, they will definitely have the letter that they're targeting in their crosshairs and they'll be able to get it much more accurately. This is one of our most popular um, customizations. Uh, we probably have uh, 35 to 40 pals that are using that. Um, and they could not type easily without this customization. I hope that's a good example for everyone. Thanks, Nachum, that's great. Um, we actually had a question that was dropped in by uh, Catherine um, about voice banking. Is there a voice banking service that any of you would recommend or deter SLPs from recommending? Okay, I'll ask. Yeah. I'll answer that. <laughs> well, um, so um, I always, if someone wants to do voice banking, voice preservation, we um, sign everyone up with the Gleason Foundation because the Gleason Foundation will fund it. I know they have a relationship with Boston Children's Hospital and um, um, Boston Children's Hospital will work with um, individuals to create the banked voice. Um, and um, if I work with someone or um, our team works with people, we usually recommend um, well, the two the two programs we usually recommend are acapella and um, well, basically we're recommending acapella and model talker, but acapella has been more more successful lately. I know there are others, but that's what we've um, been using mostly. I want to say one other thing um, that I I didn't bring up is that there is if someone has not done voice banking at all, and they have audio files. Um, 15 minutes of really good quality audio files. There is a company called Speak Unique that will take those audio files and create a bank voice. Um, the quality is um, interesting. So it's, um, it's worth a shot though for an individual to check it out. Great, thank you. And then just to answer if people aren't following the chat, um, someone asked if our services are free um, only to New Jersey clients. Our services are free to every pal that we work with in New Jersey or outside. Um, so every pal that works with us, regardless of um, ability to pay or insurance status, we do not charge for any of our services. So it's completely free. It's also worth noting since um, if this is SLPs on the call, because we're not billing, there's no conflict of interest for us 
to work with SLPs. Um, we're also not representing any technology company. Um, so we really, we're very independent and are recommending um, what is right for the individual client. Um, and then we had, um, okay, good, good question. I don't know if we have, uh, this is from Antoinette. Uh, question about what percentage of people who are initially asking about voice banking, once the process is explained, what percentage actually get to the finish line and have a voice? So of the people who start off interested in it, do we have a sense of how many people actually complete the process? That's a great question. Um, if we're working with them and they really are interested in doing it, most of them actually end up finishing it. Um, I, I'd have to go back. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really it's looked changed. at this. Well, you know, what? It's, it's also it's changed. When now that used to be sixteen hundred sentences. Oh yes. Now it's down to fifty. Yes. It's a whole different landscape. So many more people are Absolutely. finished. So that, that makes that's made a huge difference. You know, in in doing it. Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. And also uh, having the increased support, you know, both, you know, what the support that we're providing, as well as the support, you know, the coming from the Gleason Foundation, as well as, um, you know, from Boston's as well. It's a lot more accessible to people and having support, both for the SLPs that are trying to help their pals, as well as for pals that are doing it on their own. Great point. Um, okay, we also had a question about uh, story. Someone had, uh, one of the participants, I can't remember who uh, asked a question in advance about stories of success or not with Glass House. Glass House. Oh, Eddie, you're muted. I think Eddie's going to take this question. So, uh, Glass House, for those who don't know, are is one of the four major head mouse options, hardware head mouse options. There are there. Are or two of them are gyroscopic mice. One is Glasshouse, the other is Kuha Zono. The other two are the, the silver dot camera, uh, reflective dot systems, that's uh, Origins uh, Head Mouse Nano and the Tracker Pro. So uh, there, there are four kinds of head mouse and people have been very successful with Glasshouse. Um, oh, I can reach down and pull the one that's under my desk and just demonstrate it. Uh, if I can, uh, or just show you what it looks like, not demonstrate it. So it's uh, Star Trek Geordi, I think, has uh, wears the visor. So that's that's the glass house. That's what we're talking about. So uh, and it's operated uh, by head movement. I, I like to describe that your head is a joystick. It works quite well. Uh, one of the great advantages of it is that it has a very innovative bite switch for clicking uh, that you need to have a click solution that goes around with moving your pointer. One of its disadvantages is that uh, there is no local vendor in this country who will loan one. And so if you buy one and you don't like it, you have to return it to China. So uh, that's a hefty uh, ticket. I think it's about $70 to return it to China. So um, we usually, for trials, there are two companies that provide loaners, Kuha Zono, uh, through um, Grasp AT and Origin Instruments has uh, also loaners uh, through the company directly. Great. Um, and then we had a question about uh, good resources for creating manual communication systems. Um, Catherine says that she's used IESLP for simple things, but curious if there is a better option. Resources for creating manual, yeah, Trinity. Yeah, Catherine, I was actually just uh, responding to you in the chat. Um, we do have a lot of them, and um, I actually happen to know um, you also have the, a lot of them available to you through your work, um, just because I know where you work. Um, but that being said, we have a bunch of them to share um, here uh, within Bridging Voice. Um, and then there's also a couple of really wonderful websites. And I was actually attempting to look for that address for the caregiver resource. Do you, Deb, do you have that address by any chance? I'm not I love that one right now. We'll send it. Yeah, I was looking, that's what, Catherine, that's what I was attempting to look up for you is that if anybody else has that, they can drop that in the chat. And a live update um, through the miracles of Amazon and through Christine Copley's support, we now know that you can buy a glass house on Amazon and return it to Amazon successfully. 
So yes. uh, without needing to send it to China. Thank you, Christine. Oh. This is exactly what we were talking about. Is this is a great forum to share everyone's knowledge. And how much how much does the glass house cost? Do you know, Eddie or um, Christine? I think it's six fifty, but I'm not positive. Great. Um, okay, I think and, we have and time. You see that the ALS Association will loan a glass house for their constituents. That's in, in the chat as well. In Maryland. No. North Dakota, South Dakota. No, Minnesota. Oh, it would be Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Oh. Yep. Nice. That's great. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, someone submitted a question uh, when they registered asking if clients can use eye tracking to continue either working or studying. Is this is the device strong enough? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in on this. I have uh, one patient. He's He's now well known. Elicio just finished his master's in social work uh, remotely via eye tracking. So he's one of our great uh, uh, success oriented working individuals. Um, I've worked with people who are continuing to work and are writing uh, memoirs um, using eye tracking devices. I think that as an able bodied person, I'm always making sure that the device will re, you know will replace my mouse and keyboard fully and i i think we can confidently say as a team that if someone has the accuracy and the endurance and the physical abilities to move their eyes yes the technology does meet the challenge fantastic and with that we are at time um, I want to thank everyone. Thank you to the Bridging Voice team for sharing all of that knowledge. I want to thank all of you for taking an hour out of your time to join a Zoom call. I know that's less and less exciting these days, but we're so happy to have you on here and have um, so much experience. Um, please, I'll drop one more time the link. If you're interested in future trainings, um, just sign up and we will keep you updated. Our next training is going to be in October. Um, and based on your feedback, we'll be announcing what that topic is. But we're really excited to dive into all of these topics um, in depth with uh, all of you. So please stay in touch and have a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone.